The 1980 Rick James tour featuring special guest star Prince is simply fascinating as there were very few times in Prince's career when he was a supporting artist to another performer. You would really have to look at his opening act for the Rolling Stones or even his stint as guitarist and band leader for Tamar, but even then the Rick James tour was very different. For one thing, the tour packed in around 40 dates in just over two months. The concerts were generally five to 10,000 seat venues and the rivalry between Rick James and Prince was, in many ways, just what the promoters must have secretly hoped for. Labelled as the Battle of Funk, the Fire It Up tour, Prince was perceived in the press as the new upstart, the precocious challenger to the funk throne of the much more established James. This Battle of the Bands idea was something that Prince would fixate on with the time in films such as Purple Rain and Graffiti Bridge. Prince, ironically, experienced the other end of the deal when the time were garnering great reviews in just a couple of years although Prince had one major advantage in that situation, as he was able to drop the time from cities where he didn't feel he particularly wanted that fierce competition. It is interesting to see how the various parties on the tour viewed the success of each act. Patricia Smith of the Chicago Times, quoted in Dance Music Sex Romance, stated that Rick James fancies himself as the king of punk funk, and until his Thursday performance at the Uptown, he probably was king, but he probably didn't expect to be shown up by a mere prince. Rick James, however, saw things very differently, and in Matt Thorne's detailed book, Rick is quoted from his autobiography as saying, At the end of his set, he'd take off his trench coat and he'd just be wearing these little girls' bloomers. I just died. The guys in the audience just booed the poor thing to death. I must admit, I find this a somewhat strange statement, as one could ask, is there really a huge difference between these two outfit styles? Des Dickerson, who along with Bobby Z, Andre Simone, Matt Fink, who was now moving away from his jailbird costume into the iconic Dr. Fink surgical garb, and Gail Chapman, who left shortly after this tour, ostensibly struggling to reconcile Prince's explicit kissing and simulated fellatio during Head with her religious beliefs, although Gail has also stated this to be untrue and that she worked for Prince but didn't worship him, sets his views out. Des, quoted by Matt Thorne, claims that the freshness of Prince's sound the fact that he was being touted by the black teen mags as the next matinee idol, the sheer energy and flamboyance of the band and the show all just added up to us destroying the audience every night while Rick would struggle. Bobby Z, quoted by P. Nielsen, agrees, stating, We started to kick Rick's butt. We would play for 15 minutes. We were young and hungry. I think rivalry is healthy. It made them want to play better. It was kind of a traditional showbiz type rivalry. Gail Chapman also spoke of the racial tensions of the time and abuse she received for her interaction with Prince. Prince's dream of a multicoloured world of love for one another still had a long way to go. Part of the surprise for audiences was just how guitar-driven, rock fueled and visually bizarre Prince's band was in comparison to how they viewed the coy singer with songs like I Wanna Be Your Lover. As the tour progressed, James claimed that Prince was stealing his moves and ideas, and as Prince opened the concerts, it made James look as if he was cribbing Prince's image and vibe. Prince and James barely socialised, and were seen as two leaders with their own troops. Bobby Z claimed that Prince was very reluctant to spend much time with James's band due to the booze, pot and cocaine, which was not part of Prince's world. In other ways, there was much in common for the two stars. Both wrote, arranged and produced tracks, both utilised horn sections throughout their career, both were flamboyant performers and had a sexual focus. Prince, however, was just 21-22 at the time, and James a full decade older and more experienced. Prince was always an incredibly quick learner, and even James begrudgingly admits that Prince's performances improved noticeably over the course of the tour. James, however, hardened in his opinion of Prince and told Rolling Stone that Prince is a mentally disturbed young man. He's out to lunch. You can't take his music seriously. He sings songs about all sex and incest. There is, rather interestingly, perhaps another reason for James' dislike of Prince, as due to Rick James taking a date to the American Music Awards, someone he hoped to work with and maybe place as a singer in his new girl group, the Mary Jane Girls. However, after meeting Prince, his date decided to work with Prince and head his new girl group. The date was Denise Matthews, aka Vanity, and Vanity Six was born. This probably didn't help matters, nor did an almost physical bust-up when James's mother approached Prince for an autograph, Prince, who had no idea who she was, quickly exited, but after James confronted Prince, Prince apologised to them both. It was clear at this time that Prince was heading into a new direction, sexually provocative, risque, taboo busting, and was honing his live performance style. Still, few expected what came next with the Dirty Mind tour, 
and a Rolling Stone outing that thunderclapped Prince's confidence and made it clear that his crossover into the mainstream was still going to be a fight that would require some smart musical creativity. Fortunately, Prince was simply taking the first few steps of becoming a music legend.